Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening if you are uh, based in Asia, which is not uncommon for these uh, webinars on, on the Indo-Pacific. And welcome to this session that will be devoted uh, to China. Uh, China and the Emerging Indo-Pacific Order is, is the title um, Professor Zeno Leoni gave to uh, his talk, because we are very fortunate to have him with us today. Uh, Zeno is lecturer in challenges to the international order at the Defense Studies Department of King's College in London. He is also an affiliate to the Low China Institute uh, in King's College too, and uh, co-convener in the same institute um, policy brief series named China in the World. So he is a China expert for sure. At the same time, a couple of years ago in 2021, he has published a monograph titled American Grand Strategy from Obama to Trump, Imperialism after Bush and China's Hegemonic Challenge, that showed that, yes, it's on China, but it's in China in the world. So we will definitely look at something we have not touched upon yet in this series, and that is so important. We've talked about the Indo-Pacific, we have not talked yet about how China sees it. How is China looking at this uh, question that is Indo-Pacific? So Zeno, I know you will have to share your, your screen yes. and, and present your PowerPoint, but the floor is yours. Yes, thank you for the kind introduction, Christoph. And I assume you can see the PowerPoint now? Is in presentation mode? Yes, okay. I'll get on with it. And, and thanks everyone for being here today and listening um, uh, to this. Um, so um, I'll give you a bit of context of what I would like to cover for the rest of the session and why. First of all, more specifically, some context of about the, the content that I'm going to touch on in this session, uh, why I'm currently working on it or what am I up to? Let's put it um, this way. Uh, because I'm not presenting a specific paper, but I'm, 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 I'm doing some writing on, on some of these issues. Um, and then I would like to touch on, uh, I, I wouldn't know how exactly to define it. This Perhaps this idea, uh, these discussions uh, about China expanding militarily, China or China becoming more assertive in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I'm especially, perhaps my presentation is probably more relevant to beyond the first island chain. So to the Indian Ocean, because I think there's at the moment a lot of medium policy attention on this question. Is China building bases? Is China expanding? Uh, I think there are also a lot of um, uh, speculations. So I would like to take you through my way of thinking about it. Um, and then as, as it was mentioned uh, in, in the introduction by Christoph, um, I think we should also address the issue of uh, how China sees, uh, well, the change in Indo-Pacific order and, and but in particular, the elephant in the room is, I think the various US led frameworks that there are out there. And perhaps specifically, uh, AUKUS is, is really important in this regard. And I've been doing some writing on AUKUS recently, so um, I'm happy to engage the audience also on that specifically uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, and yes, we'll touch on spheres of influence. I think is becoming, is a concept that it's coming back. It's certainly becoming relevant, although spheres of influence nowadays perhaps should not be defined as they were defined in the 19th century, for sure. Uh, but I think they might be relevant again um, to the Indo-Pacific, certainly, not just to the Indo-Pacific, but for our purpose today, to the Indo-Pacific. So in terms of context, I just want to say briefly the, the sort of approach that I have, to, that you will see in this presentation, the sort of perhaps, hopefully you will find some critical thinking in it. Uh, I guess most of it comes from, uh, informs my latest book, which uh, a short book, which came out in April. 
Um, and going back to what Christoph was saying about China and the world, in reference with my previous book, the fact that I look a lot at China and the world, and also that policy series that we run with the China Institute. Um, well, I think, the, um, yes, it's about China and the world, it's about China and the West and the US. We cannot really appreciate the, the rise of China over the last 200 years if we only look at China in isolation. But it's, but it's mostly about the relationship between China and the West. And I always say, and I argue in this book that um, the West has been absolutely central in bad ways and in good ways to the rise of, to um, allowing the rise of China somehow. And this, this then I also discuss the idea of a backlash for the West eventually. Um, but actually, in so this was about the critical thinking, but in terms of content, today I'm sort of uh, reflecting on um, one particular section in one particular chapter of a monograph that I'm trying to write on the uh, new Cold War between the United States and China. And I actually call it a new type of Cold War. Uh, I won't bother you with the details of this in the presentation at least, unless anybody uh, will ask during the, during the Q&A. Uh, that's uh, less relevant for, for the focus of, of, this, of this presentation perhaps, but please do approach me. Um, and and in, the, in the section of this potentially, you know, fu future, hopefully uh, soon written book, uh, there is this section where I'm reflecting on, um, on Chinese expansion is in the Indian Ocean. And, and is, is, I think it's central to my argument about the new type of Cold War, because my, my, my idea is that this new Cold War, new type of Cold War between the US and China is very uneven. And it is really important to keep it cold, the fact that China in reality across the Indo-Pacific doesn't really have uh, a, a kind of power projection that allows Beijing to challenge US hegemony, certainly not beyond the, the very innermost side of the Western Pacific. Uh, and also China is lacking, I think, still nowadays um, any um, will to, to become an international leader. In, in my view, I think we could make we could offer many examples about China not being, uh, not pursuing international leadership, not trying to replace internationally the United States. Um, and so I want to explore this, this um, section uh, in, in this future book with you a bit more today, more in depth. Um, so, as I said, about Chinese expansionism in, in the Indo Pacific. So, I think we, uh, this is a bit challenging from an academic point of view, because especially for somebody like me who looks at grand strategies and, and theories and concepts, uh, because we tend to see a lot of journalistic reports about uh, China building new uh, uh, military bases or being, uh, being ready to, to, to perhaps you know, start working on on this basis or thinking about this basis as actually the Pentagon says in the US. Um, but actually I rarely find, um, I think satisfactory evidence out there. There is a lot of ambiguity, but I also struggle with it because, well, I, I think sometimes we're dealing with something that is very contemporary and it could be, sometimes I wonder, is this a question for academics? Or is this a question that we should leave to those who do investigative journalists or those who can really do conduct field work in very, um, uh, you know, in, in difficult areas, in a difficult area, uh, I would say. And then if we look at the, the, in particular, the reports of the Pentagon, we see that since the early years of, the, of this century, the Pentagon continues to insist on the idea that China will build a strings of pearls, which this is a phrase that is often used out there, uh, is, rarely, is rarely mentioned where it comes from. It's not China stra Chinese strategy, but it's actually a phrase that you can find in a report uh, that a, a contractor of, um, of the Pentagon um, uh, wrote for the Pentagon 
uh, uh, almost uh, 20 years ago. But that doesn't mean that is not that is not relevant. But just to put things in context, so we hear a lot of, of these claims, and I I think this is a, an absolutely important uh, question to answer. Is China uh, expanding beyond its sort of littoral or, or very local area? Um, this is probably one of the most important questions at the very top for us who look at the Indo-Pacific, uh, I would argue. And yet it's very difficult uh, to answer it at the same time. So before I, I, sorry, before I move on with uh, some more content, let me tell you my sort of conceptual reflections about it. Because I always wonder whether we should, how should we look at China expansion, Chinese expansions in the Indo-Pacific? Should we, uh, I'll, I'll just read it because that's how I frame it. Should one examine the uh, China's foreign policy behavior through the lens of the Sinologist? What do I mean by this? Th should we think that there is something specifically Chinese in the way China thinks and operates in foreign policy? Uh, perhaps there is something, uh, some, we should look at its strategic culture, which I think gives a very uh, relatively cautious picture about China. Or should we perhaps use the tools, be like the international relations uh, scholars, and perhaps uh, look at China just as you know, China is a black box. China just, just like another, any other great powers that we've seen in history, that were that have been right, that that, that arose, uh, that rose, sorry, uh, and then expanded, conquered, waged wars, um, in some cases occupied permanently, as it was the case with the Spanish and British Empire, less so with the U.S. hegemony. I think this is a bit meta theoretical, but um, how should we look at China? That's, I think, an important question. Perhaps the answer lies in between because I think China does a few things that are in, in a very Chinese way. Nonetheless, since the first Opium War, um, China has somehow been dragged into this anarchic international system and probably it has been socialized in this system. And it, op and it operates according to the sort of rules of, of the system. And so perhaps it's China is just another, also just another great power that wants to expand. Um, this is still, um, ten ex I'm still exploring these issues. Uh, I've come across recently this book, in case you're interested in more meta theoretical analysis about China. Uh, there's also some colleagues from King's writing on it, basically, the argument is that China is not, should not just be a, a case study that we use to apply Western theories of international relations. They say that China is also a theory generated event. And in fairness, China, the rise of China is absolutely disruptive in, in many ways, positive, negative ways, theoretical ways, empirical uh, ways. And, and the authors ask some, some questions in this book, in what sense, uh, existing theoretical and ontological assumptions in IR have been adequate. What is new about the rise of China in comparison to other powers, as, as I was sort of, kind of wondering in the previous slide? Um, is it even possible to produce objective knowledge about China's rise? So I think this is stuff that everyone will find perhaps refreshing and, and useful. We don't need to necessarily apply it. Uh, I, I probably do it very mildly in my next book, uh, but I think it's important to be aware of, of this. Um, so, uh, well, my, 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 my argument in, in that section of the book is that China is absolutely not there yet in terms of expanding and conquering or, or building bases in the, in the Indian Ocean. Nonetheless, um, you know, I, I look at both sides of the argument and um, I've come across um, an interesting article on, uh, on the evolution of Chinese doctrine and capabilities. And you can see that this is something we should monitor. Um, obviously, as Chinese power has been growing, Chinese, Chinese economic power, and then this has been translated in greater military power, the Chinese doctrine has also become more, which is a cautious doctrine, but has become more ambitious. 
Uh, and this is also confirmed in a 2015 white paper on military strategy produced by the Chinese government. Basically, uh, you find different phrases out there. Um, the main takeaway point is at the moment is that for me is that China obviously is ready to defend and fight in an, even in a traditional way along what, what I think we could say the first island chain, uh, the, or the littoral area, of course. Um, but overseas, it looks to, it, it uses its military power in a different way, in a non-confrontational non way for various reasons, but also because it cannot afford to do that yet. Um, well, uh, uh, other things that, that I'm looking at are, well, the fact that China is building a blue water Navy. This is uh, a fact. Um, very recently, uh, it's its latest and probably very first uh, modern aircraft carrier was launched. Probably there will be more aircraft carriers launched uh, um, prob between two and four. Uh, it, it, it depends what sources you look at. Uh, by the end of the decade. So China is in the Indo-Pacific, th there is a lot of evidence that says that China is pursuing in the Indo-Pacific a Mahanian posture. So it's building a great power Navy, a Navy that will fight uh, other great powers, perhaps. Um, on the other hand, because I told you, I, was, I just want to sort of uh, be critical about it or uh, trying to challenge uh, uh, even myself, really, try, try to look at the nuances. Um, well, you know, does the fact that China is building aircraft carriers mean that um, China is becoming, China wants to uh, adopt a great power posture uh, or, or that will be able to fight the United States or to occupy territories in the Indian Ocean? Um, well, this is debatable. And for one issue is, for example, the future of aircraft carriers, because we perhaps we tend to look at the rise of the Chinese Navy through lenses that it, they applied to Western navies a while ago, but maybe they don't apply to the future of uh, maritime power. Um, surely there are competing arguments here. I think on the one hand, aircraft carriers um, are increasingly becoming vulnerable. And I remember the Secretary of Defense of the United States uh, James Mattis, uh, Mad Dog, you might remember his nickname. Um, he was skeptic about um, giving more funds to the US Navy to build aircraft carriers uh, because he was predicting, he could already see that uh, hypersonic missiles were already out there, so-called aircraft carrier, uh, carrier killers. Um, on the other hand, I think we have been reminded by the war in Ukraine how territory it, controlling territory is still very important, and that applies to land as much as to the seas. It's important to be there for all sorts of reasons. But also aircraft carriers might be used not just to fight great powers, but also perhaps uh, for, for the Chinese to support, um, I'm just making it up now, to support their Saudi friends uh, in, during, in the conflict in, in Yemen, uh, for example. I'm just saying, I'm just... Um, making it up really. So uh, a lot of options are on the table. That's that's my main takeaway point. Um, in terms of overseas bases, obviously you know that China has only one uh, true, truly military base, which is in Djibouti, and this is not enough to give China power projection. Um, we can also think critically of, about bases in, in the Indian Ocean, especially when it comes to China. Um, I was at a meeting recently and, and, and at the prestigious think tank in the UK, and, and somebody was saying that China very soon will be, re, will be able to dispatch troops um, uh, to his bases and ports overseas, certainly in the Indian Ocean, apologies for, for a typo there, um, and, uh, and beyond. But then I wonder, um, would they make, so it, it's easy to get anxious when we see this, especially when we see these sort of comments on the news. Um, but what does it even mean sending, dispatching troops out there? And what, what can some troops achieve these days? We're talking about control of, uh, of the seas. Um, so 
there's a question there about what China can do, what China might want to do, what China might need to do. Um, and, and yes, sorry, as, as, as I was saying, troops can, can only do certain things. It also depends on what we mean by basis, by building basis. Uh, is this about, is China going to imitate, to reproduce the US model? Um, I think there are questions there. Um, certainly, one, one question is, but does China operate like the US? But also, this basis, this basis, traditional basis, would come under the spotlight very quickly. That would be expensive. It would take a long time to be built. And also, this would still involve complex or contentious diplomatic arrangements with host countries. And we have seen similar issues with the US and its allies. Um, so again, th there's a question mark there. I found very interesting an analysis from the National Defense University in, in the United States. Uh, I found it more interesting perhaps than the string of pearls model theory. Uh, and basically we have a spectrum if we look at history of, of military bases that China could develop. Um, and so I, I won't bother you with the details now, but the, the authors explore why some bases are more likely and why some bases are less likely. Uh, ultimately, they still think that, uh, well, certainly the, the dual use logistics facility is, an, is, is a feasible option. They still emphasize that string of pearls model could also become an option. Um, the difference here lies in, in to what extent uh, how many and what kind of assets China is bringing into these bases and what are the arrangements with, with the host countries. Um, but let's face it, I mean, although I'm trying to be critical, China, obviously, if it wants to be a great power, uh, that, and a great power needs to protect its, in, especially commercial interest overseas, China, in the long term, will need some, will need to protect that, will need some sort of a network of infrastructure, military infrastructure. So I'm not, I'm not escaping uh, 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 the, 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 you know, the, the, the reality, which is, you know, uh, uh, is just there. We can all understand that. Just to summarize this part of the lecture briefly, um, so it's possible that China is going to build that network in the Indian Ocean. This needs to be monitored still. Um, it might happen, it, it will probably happen, but in, perhaps in a very different way from the past. Uh, we're also far from it, um, that's, that's for sure. Uh, and, and so that's a question for us and for policymakers, which with the Indo-Pacific Research Group we, we engage with. Um, should we be thinking um, long-term uh, about this basis? And so be, be very concerned now uh, how far should we be thinking or, or should we neglect that uh, for the time being? Uh, it, it's not as important. There are other priorities. Um, this is perhaps a more policy relevant um, question. Um, so as, as China, let me take you to the second part of the presentation, uh, conscious that time is running out for me at least. Um, uh, so China is expanding in this, at the same time as the, 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 the Indo-Pacific order is changing uh, and is changing in a way that is not favorable to China. And Xi Jinping's acknowledged that uh, in the opening report of the Congress of the Chinese Communist Party back in the autumn 2022. And this is because there are, in my view, there are a series of US-led frameworks or agreements that have been taking place or have been re-energized over the last two to three years, four years. And certainly AUKUS plays a big role in, in all this. And this is creating concerns uh, about, uh, uh, you know, from a Chinese perspective. Um, so how China sees all this? I think, first of all, it's difficult to capture, uh, you know, to say that China has a comprehensive view of AUKUS, of the Quad, of other frameworks. But certainly, if you look at the debate in China, the, uh, uh, especially the academic debate, they tend to uh, frame the Quad, AUKUS, IPEF, and other agreements 
um, under the umbrella of the Indo-Pacific strategy. That's how they call it, uh, which essentially is what we normally call the US pivot to Asia. Uh, and increasingly, they tend to or might tend to um, associate the Indo-Pacific strategies of other countries um, to the US Indo-Pacific strategy. So increasingly, these are becoming the same thing from a Chinese point of view. Um, well, perhaps almost obvious to say, but that's, that's the Chinese um, argument about it, encirclement. China feels encircled. China sees a new Cold War mentality. So China is un understand that it's being contained. Uh, this is in, the, in, in an important white paper that, that the government published in 2019. But these phrases uh, were, uh, or, or similar phrases were used again uh, in recent years, um, especially when it comes to AUKUS, the Quad and Indo-Pacific strategy of, of the US. Some scholars have used a phrase that personally I, I, I sort of like, uh, I have a similar take. Uh, I discussed it in, in that article that you can see on this slide with Sarah Sinieris, um, to exclude or not exclude AUKUS and order engineering. Um, so it's about, as Biden said, it's about uh, updating, upgrading the US alliances. And in a way, in the Indo-Pacific, and in a way, they, some Chinese also see it that way. They, they've used the expression regrouping assets. So that's, that, that makes sense to me, at, at the very least. Um, there are also concerns about an arm, a new arm race, especially a nuclear one. That's a comment specifically to um, address to AUKUS, although some people don't really buy uh, the argument in the sense that, uh, well, obviously you could buy the argument of a new arm race, but the nuclear arm race is uh, argument is based on the fact that Australia is a non-nuclear country, and so some people are saying this is, AUKUS is a loophole uh, to sort of bring Australia towards that to pathway of having nuclear weapons. I, I don't think AUKUS, um, we can infer that from AUKUS. And in fact, people, other, some people in China disagree. Uh, but, but this is also in the debate. Uh, but some people interesting, and I, I kind of like that, have said that China is, um, sorry, that the US Led, US led alliances demonstrate the China, a weakness of the US. And, and perhaps I, I understand that because, in a way, what would the US be, uh, especially in the Indo Pacific, if it wasn't for its allies? Or what would be the global hegemony of the US be if it wasn't for Japan, Australia, Italy, Bahrain, and other, many other countries? So that, that, that's also an understandable argument. Anyway, what we infer from this is that there is a security dilemma, as a colleague of us, uh, Andrew Scoville, discussed a while ago. Uh, there's a security dilemma. China, um, China is saying in its latest Global Security Initiative uh, paper uh, published a few months ago, uh, China wants China is saying that its security is not taken seriously. So they are worried. Um, but, but then Andrew Scoble is asking, but does China understand that there is a security dilemma? So does China, if China is worried about the US, but do they understand that some of their actions are causing concerns in the US or in the, uh, among regional partners of the US or Indo-Pacific countries in general? And at the same time, Scoble in his article is saying, but actually does the US appreciate that China is in a security dilemma that is perceiving, that is worried about the containment and might react to that. Um, so these are, these are very important questions for us that apply to the current context in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and given that I'm running out of time, I'll just, throw, I'll just conclude on, on this note. This is my final slide. Um, we could discuss a lot on this. Uh, but the security dilemma and Chinese and US actions are bringing us back to the concept of spheres of influence. There is a special, well, there is an issue in foreign affairs, uh, April 2020. There were different articles, um, two important articles specifically, one by Hal Brands saying, 
we should fight back spheres of influence. And one by Graham Allison saying we should essentially negotiate spheres of influence. We should accept the fact that also other countries have spheres of influence. Why this article in 2020, these two published in 2020, are very important in light of the conflict in Ukraine. Perhaps not so much in the UK, but in many other countries, there's been a big debate about how do we handle the, 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 the conflict in Ukraine? Uh, do we, uh, should we give something to Russia? Should we negotiate for the sake of a greater good? Or should we actually crush the enemy? In my experience in history, crushing the enemies have had bad consequences. On the other hand, negotiating spells of influence leaves a lot of people um, uh, dissatisfied. Let's, let's put it that way. But regardless of Ukraine, I think this question that there is in Ukraine, that there is in this debate exchange between these two authors, it's coming up in the Indo-Pacific. We will have to face it, regardless of whether there is a war in Taiwan. It's there, and we need to discuss it and find a solution to it, because there is a friction between spheres of influence. Uh, I think, Christoph, I'll, I'll stop here with this probably big question, which I'm not sure I'm able to answer, but I think it will make us all think. And Thank I'll start sharing my uh, PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zeno, for this very clear and comprehensive presentation. Uh, of course, there'll be um, questions, and I invite all the people who are following us today to uh, send their questions in, in the um, box for the Q&A session now. Well, you wondered uh, in the course of your presentation whether academics um, were legitimate uh, in dealing with some of the uh, issues you, you've raised and, 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 uh, and, and you've made the demonstration that yes, they are. Uh, yes, we are. Uh, because, because of course the expertise in, in, is on the side of the academics and your expertise uh, as clearly uh, aligned in us on, on many fronts. I'd like to introduce the um, conversation that we are going to have now by um, asking uh, three quick questions. And in the meantime, I'm sure many more questions will come uh, in, in, in the Q&A box. Well, they are not equally important uh, and you may pick and choose, of course, uh, that the, the rule of the game. Uh, one, one question has to do with the words Cold War. Uh, as you say, uh, it's a new version. It, it, it's a different version. And of course, it's a different version primarily because there is such an interdependence. Uh, there is so much trade relations between China and, uh, and the West in the first place that it cannot be a repeat of what we saw uh, after 45 till the 80s. Uh, when there was not such uh, an interdependence. And my question would therefore be, um, how is this interdependence assessed on the Chinese side? Is it seen as a strength only or also a source of vulnerability? Because when you're interdependent, you're dependent. And, and how is this uh, assessed? Yeah. And, and my second question, in fact, is somewhat related to this because that's another word you've used, expansionism, uh, that I would like to, to refer to now. Um, yes, we see expansionism coming from China and sometimes we wonder, why are they alienating so many neighbors? Why are they pushing in the arms of the West countries which would prefer not to take side, including India uh, to some extent. Why this expansionism? Is it, is it not seen as expansionism at all? Or is it a risk to take? Or is it ideology? You know, uh, Because the risk, uh, I, I repeat, of, of uh, alienating others well, that can be balanced. That's why the two questions are related. That could be balanced by the idea that, well, they depend from us so much that even if we alienate them somewhat, they have no alternative. But, but that's the two questions I'd like to ask to begin with. And the last one is, of course, when you 
when you mention beyond the Indo-Pacific, the way China could, could be a leader um, for the global South in the mm -hmm. first place. Uh, how do you see this? Uh, there, there is a competition for leadership of the global, of the global South these days. Uh, and, and clearly uh, India again at the helm of the G20 would like to appear as one of them. Um, so how do you see the Chinese strategy for asserting their authority as, as, as a uh, leader uh, for the global South? That, that's something I'd like to understand from you as well. Oh, thank you, Christoph. These are uh, big questions. Uh, I'll try to follow, I'll try to answer them and try to follow the order. I think on, on the new Cold War, so in, 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 my new, in, in my new book, I basically accept the fact that there are so many differences and similarities that um, it's difficult to make comparisons in a rigorous way. And you mentioned some of, of the differences. So basically I take a different approach and I sort of deconstruct the meaning of Cold War what does cold mean? What does war mean? And how has this phrase been used in the past, not just during the Cold War? And, and I do other things to sort of deconstruct that. And the conclusion I get to, I think, is that uh, the one between the US and China is a new type of Cold War in small letters, in the sense that the frictions and the mechanism of restraints uh, might be different, are different from those from the problems experienced during the Cold War in capital letters. So I don't argue that this is Cold War number two, but um, and certainly interdependence is really key, both as a restraint and as a uh, cause of concern. And in fact, what you alluded to, I think, is this idea of weaponized interdependence. Um, and in fact, writing this book, I realized that I don't know if it, interdependence even exists. Interdependence is a box, and inside there are a lot of relations of dependence. Um, I think this is a concern in China. Um, it, it, it was very clear from the, um, uh, the, this concept, for example, common prosperity, dual circulation. So the, uh, the attempt to make China more self-sufficient self more autonomous, also because they can afford to do that, thanks to the big market. So certainly there is that concern, partly also caused by the fact that they see that the US wants to decouple, that the US wants to take steps to prevent China from modernizing in certain areas. So they react to that. Um, on the Chinese expansionism, this is a very difficult question. I, I, I struggle myself to make sense. Perhaps I can, make an, perhaps it depends on, on different issues. Perhaps we cannot look at it from just, you know, there is not just one Chinese expansionist. Because for example, I was looking at what happened in summer 2022 in Taiwan. Taiwan has been receiving weapons from the US for so many years, weapons that Ukraine can only dream about. Um, why the, the Chinese, the PLA would do all that fuss because of all that overreaction about Pelosi's visit that ultimately doesn't mean anything in comparison to everything else that the US does for Taiwan. I think in that particular case, there was a, 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 a domestic issue, nationalist constituencies, the leader just showing off that China is, is, is charged that is a strong country. Uh, on the South China Sea, perhaps I have a different reason, a different perspective. I think we're talking about China is becoming a great power. It's surrounded by um, US, many countries that have arrangements with the US. Uh, I think it makes sense for them to build what some geo geopolitician called a natural shield. And in a way, yes, China is creating a security dilemma, although it's doing this in a sub threshold way. So perhaps they understand that they need to be careful how they move. Um, you mentioned India. I agree with you. Some people describe what happened during the summer 2020 as a mistake by China because they think that since then India has been pushed 
more towards the West. I, I would be careful with, with these sort of conclusions, but uh, at least in the long term, but um, yes, I, I don't know the answer. I, I don't even know whether what happened in, uh, in 2020 had a very high um, direction or whether it was more a sort of local problem. I don't know where that came from in the chain of command. Um, but also uh, talking to Indian authorities, I understood recently that uh, there might be escalations going on, but you never know. Uh, at least that's what some Indian generals uh, told me. On the global south, so yes, China is not taking the lead internationally, in my view, because they've realized that in the short term, they cannot make, they cannot be friends with Europe or the US. That's absolutely impossible for structural reasons. So who are who are they going? Where are they going to find friends in the global south? Perhaps for obvious reasons, partly for domestic political reasons. So the forms of forms of government, partly because emerging economies they align in the same way that India and China did uh, at the conference of Party Twenty Six in Glasgow. Um, la last point I want to make: um, I think China China needs friends. So. China cannot be a power, an influential country, if it somehow does what the, doesn't do what the US did. So they need diplomatic arrangements to get other countries to support them inside the UN, inside multilateral institutions, perhaps to host some military facilities or troops. This is absolutely crucial. Ch China has always escaped this difficult question because alliances also mean uh, responsibilities but they need that. The Global South is where they will find this in the short term. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, uh, Zeno. This is, this is very helpful. And I've re just realized that, in fact, there was in the Q&A box a question ah, precisely, oh. precisely by Isha uh, on, on what position does China hold mm. in Global South. Um, so I hope uh, we have responded. But uh, do you want to uh, add something? Uh, I I think, but perhaps just one point, um, we don't know exactly to what extent China will um, expose itself in terms of alliances and, uh, you know, from a geopolitical point of view. Um, I think we are seeing, uh, this is not something I focus specifically, but I, I'm, re I'm seeing that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization yeah. and the BRICS, which for me in the last 20 years, haven't really been meaningful from a, an international politics perspective, they haven't really been influential. There might be a comeback. So they might become more just, sorry, sorry I, I say in the most simple way, used, uh, yeah. employed even more by China uh, in the future. That, that, that's, um, I'm getting this feeling. So we should watch out for those. And clearly they are looking at the global South, those, those frameworks. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you. I, I invite everybody to um, to ask questions. We have one for uh, yeah, fifteen minutes more. So make do make the best use of it. I'd like to return uh, Zeno on, on on the second point you made in, in responding to my questions. You you're puzzled as you say sometimes by uh, the way um, China behaves. Is it a reflection, well, not only of the opacity, for sure there is opacity, but is it also a reflection of a somewhat multi-vocal state? Can we, can we imagine that on some fronts, in some mm, domains, the PLA follows a policy that is not necessarily completely under the control of the civilians. What, what, what is what? What do we know uh, on, on this? Um, okay, so um, go, so we can expand on that question. Um, so I'll answer this this specific question first. I think you use the word multivocal um, in the literature. This is something I dis I discuss in my book. Um, there is this, the scholars use the phrase uh, fragmented authoritarianism. Yes. Um, I, I buy it, uh, as, as always, there are debates, but 
I buy it in the sense that um, we need to be careful. And perhaps, okay, I'm, I'm making up a bit of a straw man now, but you find, you hear some arguments in the West somehow characterizing China as if it was um, a sort of, uh, you know, a totalitarian state, mm. uh, which is not. There mm. is a lot of debate. Um, you see, you, you just need to look at academic debates or you just need to look at um, what happened recently against COVID restrictions. But we could even go back to Tiananmen Square. That was a reaction to the state dismantling the social security system. So there is a lot of debate. Apparently, there are hundreds of demonstrations every day in China. I think we just need to, the difference with the West is that there is never or there can be a challenge to the ideological pillars. So eventually what is what might be challenged is a po specific policy, as we saw with COVID, as opposed to challenging uh, the, the, the fundamentals of the state or the ideology of, of, of the party. Uh, on the PLA specifically, actually, I, I quoted a, a, an author before in my presentation, Andrew Scoble. He recently wrote an article about showing that the PLA actually that is not so keen, hasn't shown that it's so keen to expanding beyond the first island chain. Um, and perhaps this ties into what I said before about Taiwan, that for me was more the politics of it. Um, the political leadership being anxious about looking weak as Pelosi was going to, uh, to, to, to Taiwan. So I, I'm not sure we can make the argument that it's a militaristic sort of uh, a, a approach to, to these issues. Mm. Um, yes, I think I hope- Yeah, hope yeah. That's, yeah, that's very useful. The, when you say fragmented authoritarianism, um, do you refer also to, to the provinces? Can, can provinces very far from the center um, have any margin many room for maneuver at least at, at the periphery and, and and with the neighbors and secondly um there is one dimension that when we work on india we can't miss and that is the way the diaspora is mobilized is used for foreign policy objectives you, you've, you've not mentioned the diaspora at all, in spite of the fact that there are so many Chinese in the Indo-Pacific, I mean, out of China, in the um, Southeast Asian countries and, and elsewhere. Do they play a role? Do they play any role? And um, are they connected uh, even more than that, possibly controlled by or surveilled uh, by the, the Communist Party? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so on the provinces, I... Personally, so because I focus more on, on the external side of things, I, I, I wouldn't be able to say if provinces have a, a, an input, even informally. Uh, well, certainly if they do, I think it's more informal, but uh, if they have an input on foreign policy, but certainly this is something that is central to the definition of, uh, that, the definition that is provided by the literature of, of fragmented authoritarianism. So it's also about that. It's also about the fact that this is a, uh, the CCP is made of uh, around 90, has 90 million members. I think it, it's a caricature thinking that there is just one man in charge and there is no debate. It's just a caricature. Uh, and there are also uh, internal mechanisms of, of competition and, and uh, voting. Uh, so yes, that, that's what fragmented authoritarianism is. And there is also the issue of Fragmented authoritarianism also means that the center cannot always control the periphery. So that's why the provinces are important in, their, in that regard. Uh, one point I want to make, but it's just uh, a personal point on the diaspora. Um, this is something whose potential we haven't explored yet. But what I find is that something, because I've studied a bit of you know, hegemony, empires, when looking at the United States, this is probably a unique thing in history. Uh, we've never seen an empire with um, demographic power. Uh, obviously, there were empires with, you know, there was some, we have seen demographic engineering in the past, 
uh, but on a much smaller scale, we have seen obviously, uh, I don't know, you know, each empire had their own troops and officials, wherever they needed this to be. But um, I sometimes I wonder in the long term, is this going to provide China with leverage, with a demographic power, demographic leverage? Because this would be something for me unseen in history. And there is that potential. I think in Australia, um, in some constituencies, this, this has happened already. Um, I don't think we have seen it uh, in the UK, certainly, uh, or in Italy. There are some pockets of uh, where there are a lot of Chinese people concentrated, and but, but we haven't seen we haven't seen that a play a play. We read and and I believe that there is um, uh, so the CCP can reach out and and intimidate for sure. Um, so we we know that there are Chinese people who have to be careful abroad about what they do, but that's mm -hmm. one thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm speculating: will we will this lead to some sort of political influence um, in the long term? Uh, who knows? Uh, th that would be unprecedented. Yeah, yeah. Well, it it could be on the model of the Jewish lobby in the U.S., the Indian lobby in the Perhaps. U.S. Yeah. Yes, and, and certainly yes, and but it's probably something understudied. Yeah, completely. Um, something to keep an eye on. Yeah, to, to return to the Indo-Pacific regions, you know, um, as you said, China needs allies, which is which is not something we hear often, you know, <laughs> we, but it's an important point, and it has allies, um, especially in the Southeast Asian uh, region uh, now with countries like Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, does it have allies which somewhat explain the paralysis of ASEAN? Well, to some extent, we have this impression, we are under this impression that ASEAN is one of the units of analysis that does not want to take side, which is really reluctant to take any side. Is it partly because of these countries? Is it partly because of the dependence of these countries vis-a-vis -vis China? Or is it more generally speaking simply because, well, non-alignment is quote unquote in their DNA and therefore uh, it's not necessarily because of China, but a matter of principle? Yeah, I think, I think this, uh, well, give, give, okay, so, I don't think these countries are, that you mentioned are as influential within ASEAN. The problem is that because of the voting system and of the consensus, and then even one is, is enough to um, uh, get the, any process stuck, as we've seen with um, Cambodia, I think, recently. Um, I think, no, I think uh, ASEAN, it's, you know, these are the foundational values of ASEAN, not taking aside. Um, and I think, China, from its perspective, would be happy for, for ASEAN to remain as it is and to remain united as yeah. opposed to, to fragmented. I, I don't see why China would benefit from a fragmented ASEAN um, unless, and this goes back to the US-China competition, unless um, some countries, you know, yeah. This is a bit of a chicken egg question. Who 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 started? Who 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 is to blame? Who started it? But uh, unless they start to perceive that some countries are actually um, leaning more towards uh, the U.S., I think um, I don't know if there is that that risk yet. Uh, I, I, I just look at the debate within ASEAN about AUKUS. Um, there was. You know, there were some countries who didn't say much. I think these were Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, then Indonesia, Malaysia were clearly opposed. And then Singapore and probably Vietnam were sort of welcoming it. Um, so perhaps there, there's a balance for now. So that, sh that should be fine. And also, I don't know if it, mean, it means anything, but certainly Indonesia, which is a pillar of ASEAN, 
it seems to be the most sort of neutral country yes. when it comes to the US and China. I think this is also thanks to the fact that they have a big Navy. So if they need to stand up to China, they do it. They don't need the, to ask for help to the US. That's, that plays an important part. I think perhaps also the fact that Indonesia is fairly neutral, that, that contributes to the overall neutrality of the alliance. But th this will be the alliance, the association will be under a lot of pressure. So who knows? Yeah. No, definitely. This is one of the things we'll have to scrutinize. If the Philippines, if, oh, yeah. the, um, if these countries feel the need to get Americans' weapons to resist China, then, as you say, it may be the chicken or it may be the egg, but whatever the cause, whatever the first uh, original cause, that may result in uh, in some destabilization of of the ASEAN. Yeah, if I, can I just, just one point, perhaps, and this is why you said it's important, and also going back to the question on the Global South, this is why I think it's really important that we track how other countries see that, because perhaps I'm a bit naive about it, but I think if there is a minimum of cohesion out there between countries, they could decide, they could have an impact on the competition between the US and China. It's not just about the US and China. They can make the difference. Yeah, certainly. Well, we'll return to, to, to these issues. Um, thank you so much, Zeno. That was really enlightening. Thanks. And um, we'll, have, we'll have the recording uh, um, circulated. It will be available. Um, by the end of the week, uh, and, and that's very, very much a, a timely um, calendar. Uh, and the next and the last uh, webinar in our series uh, will take place on Monday. Um, William James from Kings again uh, will present the, the British uh, vision of the Indo-Pacific and the policies uh, Britain is following um, on, on, on in the region. And then we'll break because the summer break is, is, is a sacred break. <laughs> uh, but when we'll reassemble and re-initiate um, a, a cycle in September, the questions we have just raised will probably be uh, very high on our agenda, uh, just in the context of the uh, G20 meeting that will take place in India in September the Global South in the Indo-Pacific, ASEAN in the Indo-Pacific vis-a-vis China, vis-a-vis -vis India, vis-a-vis -vis the West, will be probably a, a topical uh, issue that, uh, that, that will examine. Last but not least, I do recommend everybody to read the book Zeno has referred to repeatedly today for good reasons, <laughs> uh, because many of the questions he has presented, when many of the analyses he has presented, uh, are dealt with in 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 this uh, book, in this in his latest book. So you will see it, of course, on the slide uh, that he has presented, and it will be easy to get. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.